athletes, every one of them unique. Their events are different. Their training is diverse. Their journey is anything but ordinary. And yet in the middle of all that uniqueness, there's one thing they have in common, one part of their journey that's consistent across all others. Every person who's ever played any sport at any time must at all times and in all ways overcome. And it's not only folks from the world of sports, businessmen and businesswomen, moms and grandparents, students who are finishing and only just beginning. All must learn to push through adversity and to experience their reward on the other side. Because the greatest rewards are always given to the ones who overcome. Hey everyone, welcome to Football Sunday 2017. Today is that day we've been waiting for all year long. In the next few minutes, you'll hear powerful and inspirational stories from NFL players and their wives. You'll also hear from players who are playing in today's Super Bowl. Today, the last two teams will play each other, but only one team will walk away with that Lombardi trophy. Their name will forever be etched into that reward, and it will never be taken away from them. I've been to two Super Bowls, and I know what it's like to be on the winning side and the losing side. I know what it's like when the final clock goes off and you've won and the confetti drops. And I know what it's like when the final clock goes and you've lost and your family and you are in tears. I know the joy and the pain of the Super Bowl. This will be an amazing day for all players who get a chance to play. But the greatest reward will go to the ones who overcome. We're glad you're with us. Welcome to Football Sunday 2017. I feel like the luckiest man alive. You know, I've I've been so blessed to have the experience that I've had here the that last nine years and to be appearing in my third Super Bowl. It's really hard to put into words. It validates why you do the things that you do, why you buy into the team mentality, why you support your brothers, why you do all those things when you get to go to a game like this and you get to be a part of a game like this and hopefully to win a game like this. You get to be here and, and have an opportunity to play in the Super Bowl. I mean, the, the pinnacle of, of your profession is, um, I mean, words don't accurately describe how excited I am. Once that, that final whistle blows in an AFC championship game, it rushes you right at that point. You start hugging all the guys. You're like, this is why we did all the things that we hated doing in the off season, the workouts. It's all because we want to play in this last game. kid and like everyone throws the ball and it plays catch and you pretend like I'm being the Super Bowl someday. I just feel blessed. I mean you look at where you come from and where you are now and like the path that God's taking you from is one of those things where I just worked my tail off and then just to see where I am now and that opportunity and to be on the biggest stage in the world. Getting to this game isn't the goal. You know it's, it's winning this game and so that's that's what all of our focus and our attention has shifted to. You know we celebrated the championship game you know Sunday night and then Monday morning, we are right back into our process, you know, that we go through each and every week. You know, we're just really excited. Individually, it's, you know, it's kind of like a dream come true to get here and now finishing finishing the story and winning, winning it this season would definitely put the cap on it. I got to know Anquan Bolden at the 2015 Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. I was impressed not only by his humility, but by his genuine concern for others. I'm excited for you to meet Anquan. This is his story.
It's always been a dream of mine to play in the NFL. It's probably the greatest platform that a person can have. When I first got in the NFL, I was selfish. I wanted things my way, when I wanted it, how I wanted it. It was just a, a time where I felt like I had accomplished what I set out to do. Everything that I had went through as a kid, all the hardships, all of that, you know, I felt like at that time it had paid off. You know, I was in the NFL, achieved my dream, scoring touchdowns. So yeah, I was on top of the world. I think when, when I had my son, for me, it brought about a new perspective on life. I realized that everything I did affected him in one way or another, whether it be good or bad. There was things that I went through in my life that I never wanted my son to go through. And I just realized, man, there was things that I was doing that I just couldn't do no more. I wasn't living for just Anquan anymore. So I became a little more serious about my relationship with my now wife. She saw in me what at times I couldn't see. And she used to always tell me, I see the man that God wants you to be. I see the man that you can be. And whenever you have somebody challenging you like that, you have to take a look at yourself. I want to be able to worship in every aspect of my life. I want to be obedient in every part of my life, in my marriage, in my job, in my finances. I mean, there's times where God is asking us to step outside of our comfort zone and go to Africa. There's other times where God is asking me to step out of my comfort zone and do an interview or speak before a crowd about my life. I've always wanted to help those that are in my community because it's not a lot of opportunity there. Initially, I never wanted to start a foundation. I wanted to do everything anonymously. And then I had this older gentleman come to me and he was like, look, you doing things behind closed doors, that's fine. But if you want people to partner with you, it would be good for you to start a foundation. We started with my hometown, Pahokee, Florida. Small town right on Lake Okeechobee. You know, so we have different programs. Education is a huge component of ours with the foundation. So we have a summer enrichment program, which is credit recovery for kids that are falling behind in school. We get those kids back on track to graduate. The more that I fell in love with Jesus, the more I looked for opportunities to serve people. Like what I do is not for an award. I don't help people to be recognized. Like if I can do it all behind closed doors, I would. But we do do it for a greater reward. Like the Bible tells us to store up our treasures in heaven. So how do we do that? By doing the will of God here on earth. Until you really seek God, you won't really know him. And sometimes the only time that people will get to know who God is, is by watching our lives. Anquan has devoted his life to helping other people overcome the obstacles that stand in their way. And his story can be our story. We all have people in our lives that need us to help them overcome. They may see a wall that stops them, but we can help them see a bridge that connects them to a future with promise and hope. So when you look at the people in your life, who needs you to help them overcome something that's too big for them to handle on their own? When you look at the beginning of the season, we didn't have Gronk, we didn't have Tom, we had a, a, a new quarterback in there, and we really didn't make any excuses. We beat three good teams. That was a challenge for us, but I think it was good for our football team because we realized that uh, we had a really strong football team uh, without 
Tom being there, and we knew that when he came back, we'd be great. And I think that was a really unifying time for us. It was a very exciting time for us. It was so fun because it wasn't just Tom's team, it was the Patriots. And then we got a supercharged boost when, when Tom came back. And uh, you know, we've just been playing for one another all year long. Guys just saying, none of that stuff matters. You know, let's just come go to work, work hard, and let's just see what we get. That's really what we became this year, is just a blue collar team. That whole group, that whole team, the coaches believe in one another. This has been an especially, especially unique year in relationship to the amount of high character people that we've had in our building. And that goes from cafeteria assistants to assistant strength coaches to coaches that are amazing and they're growing like crazy to all the way up to the top to ownership and our head coach, just phenomenal people who have really had an extra attitude of humility this year. Now it's just that, that last game, one more. I don't think the expectations on the outside were high, but we had high expectations for ourselves. This offseason, I think, was really huge for, for us as a, as a team, as an organization. Uh, Coach Quinn brought in some Navy SEALs. Kind of wanted to instill in us the brotherhood that the military has. They were really able to share with us their experiences, and it's amazing the similarities that, you know, the concept of team and what that means to, you know, all of us. Don't let the guy next to you down and do your job so the guy next to you can do his. Regular season, when you see the other team score, it's gonna be one guy alone, smiling, posing for the camera, doing his little thing. Wait until we score. Go back and look at the film and you'll see guys huddled around, guys celebrating. You'll see running backs handing the ball to offensive linemen to spike it. From Mr. Blank to the general manager to Thomas Dimitri, everybody bought in to this brotherhood. Everybody bought in to, oh, it's just not about me. And iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. And the accountability piece, you know, all those things that we know are possible they became possible for the team this year, and that's how they ended up where they are right now. Hey, this is my wife, Kirsten. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here. We've been married for 11 years, five kids. That's right, five kids. Right, and whoever said marriage was easy was clearly never married. Marriage is tough. And this story is about two people who have overcome their past to have the thriving marriage they have today. We have watched Brandon and Mishi Marshall grow personally in their relationship with the Lord and with each other, but it wasn't easy. This is their story. We grew up in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that now is the poorest neighborhood in all of Pennsylvania. It was very volatile, a lot of drugs. My father actually sold drugs, what he did for a living. But I remember my mother sitting in her room day in and day out, smoking cigarettes and getting to a point where she would have a fifth of Hennessy every single day. There was uh, fighting. Um, but there wasn't only just fighting in our house, there was fighting next door, there was fighting across the street, the street over. Me, she and I married, I thought couples fight. I thought families fight, but you just, you know, that's what happens and you just get past it, you make up. But it was my belief because of the environment I come from. So I had to drop all of my belief, my belief system that was formed starting at the age of two and figure out what is a woman, what is a man? How am I supposed to treat a woman? Because I've never seen that in a healthy way. I grew up in a single parent household. My father, and I use that term loosely, was an abuser. He abused my mom. And I didn't grow up in a household with abuse, so to speak, because my mom was able to get away from that. I was molested when I was younger, the age of 12. This is probably my first time ever saying this on an open forum, but to have not ever been able to trust a man, to have not known anybody that would be able to protect or provide, shaped me. I didn't know what it was for a man to love a woman. I also didn't know what it was to love a man, because I didn't see it. seeing my parents argue or seeing others argue or seeing the dysfunction in my household and, and, and saying, that's not right. I didn't know right. 
but I knew that wasn't right. There was this, uh, this, this period of five or six years where my life was spinning out of control, and I just didn't even know better. It wasn't until I got with Mishi and we started seeking and starting surrounding ourselves with saints and the right people to pour into our lives and diving into the Word and praying and meditating on the Word where that clarity came. So before I even had children, I wanted to help the next generation of my family um, better themselves. And in order to do that, I have to live my life by example and live my life the best way that I can and the best way that I know how. Now that we have children, it's a whole nother ball game because not only am I responsible for helping them see Christ, I'm responsible for leading them up in Christ. We need to break the cycle. So we went through this whole thing of bettering ourselves, bettering our marriage, bettering our communication. You know, we just worked on it. The covenant that Brandon and I made with each other and the covenant we made with God is that we will break the generational cycle in our family. We will take our marriage seriously. We will show each other grace. We will work through our struggles and we will find purpose in our pain. I just remember praying for four or five years, Father, help me break this cycle. I'm sitting on my knees and I'm praying and I couldn't get any words out and I just started laughing because in that moment, it was the first time I was able to say, the cycle was broken. I love what they did. To make a covenant not only with each other, but individually to say that I am a new creation. And despite what happened to me in my past, I am gonna overcome those circumstances. And maybe it's your turn. Maybe it's time for you to overcome the bad decisions, the pain that somebody else brought on you. Maybe it's your turn to experience the freedom that comes only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Um, having to deal with an injury this year and having to miss some time um, is very tough. Obviously there's the physical pain that you deal with, but there's an emotional aspect to that. You know, it's easy to sit back and say, yeah, I'm a Christian when everything's going well for you. And, and to give everybody else advice, but when you're having to actually put your faith into action and, and trust that, hey, the Lord's got you no matter if you get back on the field or not, um, you know, that was something that, that I was really challenged by this season. And thankfully, he brought me back to the football field, but I think it did a lot for my personal growth as a, as a Christian. A good friend of mine and a former teammate from Auburn uh, a few years ago passed away in a car accident, and he was you know, one of my dearest friends, and while he may have been younger than me, you know, he was a role model to me. His name was Philip Lutzenkirchen. You could talk to him about anything. And, uh, you know, when he when he passed away, that was that was a tough thing for me to go through. I mean, I had lost family members before, and but something was different, you know, being a little younger and losing somebody that, you know, is around your age, that was something that was, it, you know, it was really hard for me to get through. We all want to be comfortable. We think God's going to be a comfortable God. We think that it's going to make us, make life easier, and that's so far from the truth. He was diagnosed with uh, cancerous tumors in his kidneys. And it's a, a rare condition, it's a bilateral Wilms tumor. It's probably 25 cases a year. And we started off with 19 weeks of chemo, and then they said, you know, we're gonna go a full year. So he's a full year of chemo. The tumors are still there, but the, the tumors have shrink, uh, shrunken dramatically, which is awesome. And so what right now we're doing is surveillance and kind of God's holding us in this holding pattern to not tell you it's over, to not tell you it's not over. So we just have to trust in Him through all that. In this life, we all experience physical and emotional pain. Just this year, I lost a loved one, like many of you had before. And I can tell you that pain is one of the hardest things to overcome. DeBricka Shaw and Kirsten Ferguson have experienced deep pain, and it's something that has not gone away quickly. This is their story.
A friend of mine was his publicist at the time. Um, she wanted to uh, all go out one night. So I said, sure, let's go. You know, I saw Kirsten. Uh, I knew as soon as I saw her, I was like, okay, you know. I'm, I'm probably gonna you know, try to get at her a little bit because you know, she was nice. It was just easy and fun. Kind of all the things you dream about as a little girl, you know, you meet your husband, the love of your life, and you move into a beautiful home, and then you have children, and you kind of live happily ever after, and that was kind of my mindset. I knew that I wanted children one day, but that one day wasn't that day. We got pregnant, and it was like, this is what was supposed to happen, you know? We went in and we saw the ultrasound, and I'm just chit-chatting with the girls that are doing the ultrasound, and then all of a sudden it, it went quiet. And you know, my doctor told me, you know, by this time you should definitely see a heartbeat, and but there wasn't even, there wasn't even a baby. It was, it was, there was nothing. The intense pain just starts and it's full on labor basically. So I'm screaming, Brick is running up and down the stairs trying to get me like hot pads for my stomach and the baby passed while he was downstairs and I just remember screaming his name and he comes running in and it looks like a murder scene in our bathroom. Like she's very, very weak at this time and I'm like, well, I have to be strong because we're supposed to lean on one another. Brick lifts me up and he says, don't you dare look in that toilet and he flushes it. He's like, that's not where our baby is. God had shown up in my life before and so I knew that he was real and I just knew that this was one of our trials. I was just focused on having kids, and I was like, Brick, you need to get on board. And he was like, I'm not ready. So there was just so much attention on having a child. There was so much attention on this vision that I was not seeing the same way. I think as we talked to the counselors and kind of laid out how we were feeling, it kind of quieted down a little bit because we finally felt heard. It was a rough time, but I feel like that six months, we needed that six months. At that moment, we finally were able to plan something together. And we got pregnant the first time. We were planning our trip to Israel, um, so my doctor was like, before you go, you know, I think everything should be good. She just wanted to check on the baby and make sure everything was fine before we left. So we went in at um, eight and a half weeks. The lady, you know, put the gel on, and I look at the screen, and there was no heartbeat. The baby was just lying at the bottom of the sack, and uh, that was really hard. It was really hard, and I remember saying, "Like, there's, a, keep checking, like, make sure." And, and but there was nothing. The baby was just. I was angry with God. I was mad. I, I just, I couldn't understand it. It was so hard to just live everyday life. The hardest day for me was we went to church on Mother's Day. The pastor asks all the moms to stand up and she gives every woman a rose that stands up. And that feeling of having to stay seated was so heartbreaking. Like I said, church started to be a really hard place for me. So it was one of those days and um, I was tearing up and, and a, a random woman came up to me. I had no idea who she was. She didn't know who I was. I was trying to kind of just stand off to the side a little bit. Um, and she said to me, God has not forgotten you. And I was blown away, blown away. And I just broke down and she's like, oh, I didn't mean to make you upset. I was like, you have no idea what those words just meant to me. And 
I remember just having hope in that and just saying, okay, God, I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I know you're still there. And I got pregnant. I felt more prepared. I felt like, okay, I'm ready for this step. It was like an exciting time, but it was also very scary because I'm like, this is the third time. We've been here before. I don't even know if I have words that can describe the joy I felt. I didn't know how to feel, you know, I'm like, there was just so much, uh, I was overwhelmed. It was just like, of course it's you, of course I was waiting for you. God has not forgotten you. In our pain and our struggles. In the uncontrollable events of our lives, God has not forgotten us because he has written our names in the palm of his hands. And ultimately, that's why we can overcome. It's not because we try harder. It's not because we get stronger. It's because we acknowledge that the person who overcame sin and death is the one that gives us the power to overcome. In Revelation 1.18, Jesus says, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. Don't miss this. Jesus holds the keys to death. And it's that power, it's that power over death that gives us the ability to overcome. There is something in us that wants to know Him. Some of us try different ways. We try to go to church. We try to do nice things. Maybe we give money. Maybe we don't say certain words. Whatever it may be, you name it. We try to get back to Him in our own way. But there's only one way. And today is your day. If you want that, Jesus says, I'm open to anybody. And He says, what you must do is repent. You must turn from your ways and put your faith and trust in me. If today is that day for you, you don't want to wait any longer. I love to, to lead you in a prayer. And you pray something like this in your own words. Lord, I thank you for bringing me here today. I thank you for allowing me to see this message and hear your voice. Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm separated from you. Lord, because of your holiness, I can't have a relationship with you, but God, I want to be made right with you. Lord, I understand that I deserve death because of the things that I've done and because of the sin that resides within me. But I also understand, God, that because of your son, Jesus Christ, I can be made right with you. So Lord, right now, I want to repent and I want to put my faith and trust in your gift of salvation. Lord, I understand that because of this, my debt has been wiped clean and I am now your child. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you prayed a prayer like that just now, I wanna be the first to congratulate you. I'm happy, the angels are throwing a party for you right now. You think a Super Bowl party's big? The party in heaven is huge for those that come into the family of God. You are now in new life, and now you can overcome because he overcame. Not because you have the power to overcome, but because now he will live through you, through his spirit, and give you the power to overcome. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations, you are now in the family of God.
Today on the field, the reward will go to those who overcome. But in our lives, the best reward ever, given to us by God himself, is given to those who overcome. Our names will be etched into that reward, never to be taken away from us. And when we learn to live our lives with that on the horizon, God gets the glory. Have a great Super Bowl Sunday. Enjoy the game.